Welcome, everybody. Hi, my name's Greg Javer. I uh, am here today. I want to do, uh, I'm excited. I got a package in the mail today, a uh, package of West Coast paperbacks. And uh, I want to bring to you our second Edwood Summit. Last time around, I had some friends of mine with me, but this time, uh, just going to be me. I'm going to do a little unboxing here, a paperback haul. Uh, so let me give you a little bit of the methodology. Actually, uh, first, let me say, I was really excited. I, I ordered this, this uh, group of books two days after Christmas, maybe a day or so after Christmas. Today is, what is it, January 19th, something like that. And so they finally arrived today because of the you know, slow shipping. It took a little while to get here. So I was really like eager. And as my workday wore on, I was like, are they going to get delivered here before the end of my workday? Because I'm excited for right after work to crack open a beer and uh, unbox these paperbacks. And sure enough, about 15 minutes before the end of my workday, the uh, US Postal Service showed up put the package outside my door. And so here it is. So it's again, 14 paperbacks, West Coast paperbacks. So let me talk a little bit before I open the box and start digging in, let me talk a little bit about kind of the methodology behind it. So it's a, a, a bit of a fishing expedition related to Edwood. I don't, by the way, to give you guys a spoiler alert, there is very unlikely any Ed Wood books in this box. It is entirely a fishing expedition, fishing around publishers, uh, that he had worked with in the 1960s and early 70s when he was writing paperbacks. So all the books in this box are from publishers that published Ed Wood books. I have no indication whatsoever that any of them are Ed Wood books. Some of them, in fact, I know they're not. I know they're written by actual people. Many of them, though, are written pseudonymously. So potentially um, there could be uh, an Ed Wood book in the box. Again, highly unlikely. You think about the tens of thousands of adult paperbacks that got published uh, during that era, and uh, it's, it's very unlikely that I would stumble upon another one. Why would I even think that, actually, more importantly? Well, let me tell you. Ed uh, published potentially 140 paperbacks during his life. This is something I read once or twice, something I think he made one very vague claim to. What we know is that there's roughly 70 paperbacks, give or take a few. There's a few disputed titles, could be Ed, could not be Ed. What we know are there are roughly 70 paperbacks uh, issued from 1963 all the way through 1978 during kind of the, the period of time when he was actively writing paperbacks as well as getting into the adult industry and film, et cetera. But uh, during that time, we know of 70 titles, give or take a few, and uh, that are more or less definitively Ed. Many are attributed by himself uh, on his own resume. Many of them even are uh, ascribed to Ed on the cover. Many of them are under a wide variety of pseudonyms, some known, some not. So uh, so why would I uh, engage in this? Uh, well, first off, knowing that there's very little likelihood that there's going to be an Ed Wood book in this box, it's not going to disappoint me, by the way. I was able to get these things for an extraordinarily good price and was very happy uh, to get some books from these uh, publishers that Ed worked for. And that in and of itself is going to make me happy. Um, that said, we're not going to engage in textual analysis here today. It's strictly an unboxing. want to display the books, give you a little bit of background around them. Uh, why they are related to Ed Wood, things of that nature. Uh, had I've done this before, actually, only one time previously, where I picked up a whole ton of paperbacks from publishers that uh, Ed had worked for at one point along the way, or had published at least one or more of his books. And uh, curiously enough, within the 15 or 20 paperbacks in that in that group of books that I bought about a year and a half ago. There was one that jumped out at me as sounding very much like Ed, clearly written under a pseudonym. I got lots more work to do on it, so I'm not going to reveal that to you today. Again, the, the point here is not to uh, find new Ed Wood, although uh, that would be a positive externality, as Adam Smith would have said, a very positive externality, because uh, the amount of money that I spent on this box of books, if there happened to be an Ed Wood paperback in this box, uh, it would pay for itself five times over, uh, just on the basis of that one book alone. Again, not what I'm expecting, not what is likely to happen, but uh, let's find out. So again, I've waited long enough now, I've been waiting for more than three weeks for this box, so very patient of me, right? Uh, you're probably thinking to yourself, uh, three weeks, Greg, that's not exactly a long time. Uh, but I, again, I was eager. I have, again, if you watch the first Edwood Summit, you saw that uh, 
I spoke uh, along with my friends and colleagues about how we're, we're very uh, extremely interested in many aspects of Ed Wood's uh, life and art for our own personal reasons, for a wide variety of reasons, which again, not gonna get in here to today. I wanna get into the box, so let's do it. All right, let's cut this sucker open. Yes, I have a very large knife in my hand to cut this box open. Overkill. All right. Invoice on top. I will share uh, the invoice with you when I finish uh, to share with you just absolutely what an astonishing deal I got on these books. So, some packing material on top. Let's get that to the side. All right, I'm gonna take these in no particular order. As you can see in the box, they're in, they're in two, uh, two piles. I'm gonna take them left, right, left, right, left, right, all the way down. So, number one, book number one. RX Manhunt. Prescription Manhunt, is that what I had to take that to be? There's a little stethoscope around the RX on the cover. I think we're getting a little bit of glare, unfortunately. Let me see if I can correct that. A little better, a little less glare. So uh, credited to Ruth Berg, don't know who Ruth Berg is. On the back there is a stethoscope as well as uh, it looks like a, a nurse's hat laying on the ground. So who knows what transpired there. So right off the bat, most importantly, this is a pad library book, P-A-D. Pad, another pad library bestseller was their, their little logo. If you can make it out without the glare, which is a little hard, I think. My bad. So pad library nonetheless uh, published a number, one of Ed's uh, more uh, prolific publishers that he worked with outside of, uh, you know, everybody knows about Pendulum, Calga, Sex Press, EduSex, the, the grouping of publications that uh, were run out of, uh, you know, the West Pico office on West Pico Boulevard in Hollywood, where Ed worked as magazine staff writer. But he wrote for a wide variety of other West Coast publishers. Uh, prior to that, during that time frame, more than likely Moonlighting, I would imagine, which is where he may or may not have attributed himself or, or utilized his own name for a lot of those books because he may or may not have been Moonlighting. In any case, uh, let's take a look at the inside. This is in great shape, by the way. This does not look like it's ever been read ever, not one bit. It's in near perfect condition. Spine is tight, everything. Just a couple little scuffs along the edges of the cover from, I presume, storage, uh, shelf storage. So this is the pad library, uh, the page that opens every pad library book that I've seen. And I've seen, you know, not only a few of Ed's lit uh, pad library books, but a few other titles that I've collected previously as well. Attention. This book is a work of fiction and was written for adult literary entertainment. While the basic theme may have occurred many, many times in real life, all of the characters, incidents, and events were created from the author's imagination. The primary purpose, dot, 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 is to chronicle fictionally, dot, 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 the way of life of our contemporary society, the editor. So there's the editor's preface. Again, it's common to all the I'm not suggesting by dot, 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 that the mere presence of ellipses are the uh, are an indicator of the presence of Ed's hand, although they are a contributing factor. If you get that within a cluster of other other sort of textual cues, uh, and you know Ed's would quite well, you could um, certainly take the ellipses as a, as a main point of consideration as a piece of uh, something with some evidentiary value. At this point, again, I'm just read. I just read the editorial. Uh, bit at the opening. Copyright 1967, Pad Library, General Delivery, Agora, California. So their offices again, West Coast. Uh, I'll just read the first couple sentences, page through it a little bit and give you a little flavor for the book. Chapter one, time always rushed by Ruth Arnold, but of late there seemed to be a slowing down. Even her work as head nurse at Heighton Hospital's busy ninth floor had lost its glow. Something important seemed to be missing. She slammed the drawer of her desk shut, 
fill the day's orders on the board, and walk to the main desk to answer the telephone. So uh, immediate reaction to it, that doesn't really, there's nothing distinctive in there that sounds in any way distinctly like Ed. In matter of fact, uh, Ruth Arnold, that's fairly uncommon, not that he didn't use first and last names for his characters, but more often than not, his characters strictly have a first name. And uh, the language sounds, uh, it doesn't have anything weird about it to give me any indicator. So let's page through a few more pages and just randomly go to a paragraph. 15 minutes later, she found him seated at a corner table. He took her order and came back with the tray. Dr. Miller has decided to stay a couple of months until we can get adjusted to the change. He has decided to cater to a Park Avenue practice. She saw the deep disapproval on Dr. Denton's face. We can thank Maida Gregory for that, whether they're together or not. She's not in love with him, but she can see that financial gains in such a setup. All right, so again, last name again, and uh, pretty normal sort of straightforward prose. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be a sex book, 1967. So let's talk about that for a second. So uh, increasingly as the 60s wore on, adult paperbacks became more and more graphic. I think, uh, you know, things like Naked Lunch, William Burroughs' Naked Lunch, uh, the Tropics, uh, Henry Miller's Tropics, Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn. These things had started uh, challenging uh, free speech law in the United States in the early uh, 1960s. And uh, free speech, the barriers started to fall away in many ways, not just across the publishing industry, but ultimately it allowed for paperbacks to become increasingly graphic. And uh, they did so slowly over time. By this point, 1967, just superficially glancing at this, this looks pretty quaint. Like I'd, I'm not gonna page through it right now to try to find you a sex scene to see just how graphic it may be, but I wouldn't suspect it would be all that graphic by the standards which we know of today. It would be kind of quaint trying to dance around the subject using a lot of euphemistic sort of language and things of that nature. Nonetheless, there's number one, Ruth Berg's RX Manhunt. Cool. All right. So, number two. This one I'm actually is one of the more exciting uh, books in the box, uh, three books in the box by this publisher. And I'm really excited because I've never actually seen a book from this publisher yet. And uh, contradicting what I said earlier that all the books in this box were uh, published by a publisher that somehow worked with Ed. There are a few um, uh, other gambits, which I'll get to as we go through it. One of the gambits though, I don't know that it's really a gambit. So uh, I read an interview recently where a writer named Jim Gilmore, paperback, uh, reputedly a paperback writer in the 1960s, spoke about uh, working with Ed Wood at a paperback publisher in the mid roughly mid 1960s called France Books. Now I'd never seen this anywhere else. Now I know that uh, of course Dick Trent is credited for uh, Everybody Does It, a French line uh, book put out. I think French lines is a different publisher than France Books. France, as you can see has the logo of the flag right on the cover, France. Uh, every copy I've ever seen of one of these online, now I've got a few copies, fortunately, they all say first American printing. I doubt there was a second American printing. The publisher seems to have only existed from 1962 to 1963. That's uh, all the copyrights on probably the 20 or so France books titles I've been able to track down so far. I'll say 1962 or 1963. Now, does that mean Ed worked there? This gentleman uh, said that he did, which books would be Ed? I've never again seen any indicator whatsoever that uh, anybody knows of a, a book by France Books that was written by Ed Wood. So again, not saying it is, it isn't, but it's interesting. This one for sure is not Ed Wood. I know this because it, uh, The Fair Sex is the title, Life of a Las Vegas Cab Driver. So it's written by, I think the, the title page should tell me. Yes, it's written by a gentleman on The, the Fair Sex by Frank Moline. So I think maybe my picture's backwards on the video, but The Fair Sex by Frank Moline. So Frank Moline was an actual paperback writer who actually wrote a number of books that were set in Vegas. So I assume he knew Vegas, probably was from Vegas. Um, this of course is one of them. Now uh, let's go to the copy. Well, let's actually look at the the initial page. So it gives us a little a little snippet here and gives us a little sense of what the book's about. Without a word, he strode over and lifted her in his arms. She struggled for a moment, then relaxed against him. 
Her head continued to throb while his hands removed the dress and slip. Please turn off the light, please. She was squirming in discomfort as his gaze bore down on her. This was the first time that a member of the opposite sex had viewed her completely undressed, except, of course, her physician. She tried vainly to cover her breasts with her hands. So again, that's about as graphic as this is going to get in 1962 or three. Let's see. Let's go to the, the copyright page. Ought to be next. Uh, 1962. So the publisher is, of course, it says France Books uh, with the logo on the cover. But the copyright is International Publications Incorporated at an address on Melrose Avenue. 8340 Melrose Avenue, Hollywood 69, California. And it gives a little blurb about it being fictitious. And then, quite incredibly, and this is another reason why, uh, you know, the France series uh, was interesting to me in and of itself, separate and apart from the fact that Ed may or may not have worked there. If you could, I don't want to, the spine on this one's a little bit dry because it's so old. So I don't want to open this too much. But again, I think the language is backwards. But if you can read it all the way down at the bottom there, it says cover photograph well let me read the exact language cover photo in the bold face if you can read that cover photo in reverse perhaps it's in reverse i see it on my screen in reverse cover photo by yes if it is in reverse and you can read in reverse hal guthu so that's hal guthu who um ran uh his own studio on santa monica boulevard during the late 60s and early 70s where ed shot uh features as well as uh was very likely involved uh pretty deeply in uh, a lot of loop production, eight millimeter short adult films. So uh, Hal Guthu, really interesting guy. Uh, if you are interested in Hal Guthu, even a, even a smattering of interest in him, at the Ed Wood uh, Wednesdays uh, part portion of the Dead to Rights blog, and I'll link to this in the in the description box of the video. Uh, and in fact, th this video. Uh, you may have found it through Edward Wednesdays because uh, I intend, I've been writing articles at Edward Wednesdays now for a uh, little over five years and written often about Hal Guthu and about his sets and about the set decorations there. So I certainly uh, would uh, direct you to read some of that if you're interested in uh, learning a little more about Hal Guthu. But he was, a t he was a talent agent. He was a photographer. He ran his own studio. He was a cinematographer. He shot some feature films, including uh, credit. He has a credit as one of the co-cinematographers on Necro Romania, Ed's Necromania, 1971, his uh, astounding uh, adult feature, which there's nothing quite like Necromania, uh, shot at Hal Guthu's studio. So this cover model shot by Hal Guthu. France book, this is one early in the series. The series starts with a uh, numerically, the index numbers at 1000. So this is 1005. So this is one of the earliest in the series. The France name is your guarantee of exciting and entertaining reading. Indeed. So uh, then we've got chapter title index or chapter index. Uh, let's read the first paragraph, just a couple sentences. The sign stated very clearly that it was unlawful to advertise rates. The lower line suggested a personal inquiry obviously directed to those travelers interested in frugality. Again, I know this is not Ed Wood, so I'm not gonna expend a whole ton of time on this. You guys are uh, gonna get bored of uh, hearing this kind of stuff. Let me just read, here's a part where it's, it's getting a little risque. They entered the bedroom and fulfilled their desires. An hour later, both were dressed. <laughs> so that, took, again, that shows you how quaint they could be. That completely elided the sex scene, the part I just randomly turned to. Um, Pictures repeated on the back cover of the of the cover model. Some of these France books, and I have a couple more in the box on the way here shortly. Some of them actually have fold out uh, images on the front cover. This this early one it does not. I'm hoping that maybe one of the ones that I have here in the box does. The uh, back cover. Read that blurb for you just to uh, be thorough. The Moo Moo continued its downward trek, revealing rounded thighs, silky to his touch. With a deft movement, he threw the robe to the floor, leaving Vinny nude and trembling in his arms. Her dark hair had tumbled about her shoulders and her lovely face was distorted with passion. The bursting within him was answered by her own need for love. All right. Wonderful, right? <laughs> Sounds like a great book, right? Life of a Las Vegas cab driver. So, uh, Again, you could tell uh, by the language from inside the book, 
the, the language on the back cover actually sounds a little bit different and it stands to reason somebody who could have been writing the promotional material could have been somebody else than the person who was actually writing the book. Again, I'd have to dive a lot more deeply into all that and really get a handle on, you know, Frank Moline's uh, style, his literary style, things like that, literary style. You're probably like, uh, Greg, you can't really call it that. I did so, uh, and I will, because it was a very vibrant uh, enterprise paperback, uh, adult paperbacks, and it really, although is com almost completely disappeared, it still exists to a degree, amazingly enough, but it largely disappeared because pornography, hardcore pornography, became uh, commonplace and mainstreamed by the early 1970s, certainly by the mid-1970s, you know, at just about any, any city, uh, medium-sized city in the country would have had an adult shop somewhere where you could have bought hardcore magazines, where you could have bought maybe hardcore uh, eight millimeter films by the late seventies, of course, videotape VHS, the uh, adult industry immediately adopted VHS even prior to the actual mainstream film industry. Uh, so why would you read, uh, unless you really liked reading adult paperbacks, uh, if you were reading them for kicks, right, you had things that could deliver those kicks much more intensely than via a paperback. In fact, I've always had this feeling that a lot of guys probably at the adult shop, maybe they buy a paperback, they see paperbacks on, on the rack, they read a blurb, they see a picture of a pretty girl on the cover and maybe they're like, oh yeah, I want to check that out. They get maybe a chapter into it and they're like, this is boring. This is really boring. I'm going back out. I'm, I'm going to go uh, to the grindhouse. <laughs> so next up. All right. So again, this is one from a different publisher that uh, I don't know that ever published anything by Ed Wood, but West Coast publisher. So I figured again, it's a fishing expedition. So cast your cast your line and see what see what you can, might may or may not catch. So this is Religion and the Sexual Life by Dr. Walter P. Clayton and Stephen Gregory. It's a late hour library fact book and the publisher is Phoenix Publishers, and that's spelled P-H-E-N-I-X. And they're out of San Diego uh, on Camino del Rio South, uh, San Diego. So this is copyright 1968. Again, grabbed it strictly because it got a good price, thought it was a good supplement to the uh, group of books that I was gonna be checking out here today. And uh, don't know, again, very extremely unlikely, more so than even the books, uh, uh, some of the other books that we're gonna look at that Edward would have had anything to do with this, but gives you a little color, and this is interesting to me personally, gives me a little color around uh, adult paperback industry generally, what, what was the nature and uh, tenor of it, find out about different distributors, very competitive dis um, distribution industry, obviously, there were lots of publishers. There were a lot of publishers who, uh, um, had a lot of different brands as well. So they were uh, pretty diverse and uh, put out under put out books under different imprints from the same publisher. Pendulum's a good example. They started spinning things off like into Calga and uh, ultimately EduSex and SECS Press. There's complicated reasons why that was. They, they needed to do it for reasons to, to get away from Pendulum when uh, Michael Thevis, uh, the gentleman who funded Pendulum, the West Coast operation that started Pendulum Publishers back in Atlanta in the mid 60s. Uh, once he got in hot water, ended up on the FBI's top 10 wanted list, got convicted of murder and things like that. He did some bad things. So Bernie Bloom, Ed's boss, had to start to peel away a little bit. So he had to push Pendulum out of existence and Calga out of existence. And he started up uh, these other publishers, which fundamentally were producing the same exact kind of content, uh, same staff writers. They look the same. They, uh, if you look at an SECS Press magazine or an Edge of Sex uh, magazine from 1974, if you look at a Gallery Press magazine from 1975, you'll see there's a lot of, of correspondences with the, the earlier Pendulum magazines from as early as 1968 through about 1970-71. Uh, point here being, um, this unrelated to Ed almost entirely uh, would be my full confident suspicion. I'll read again just a little bit. This actually, it's the print is really small here and the book actually goes on for 160 pages is not odd, but this printing is extremely small compared to uh, the printing I typically see in one of these. So this is a much longer manuscript than was commonplace. Uh, 
looks like it's got case studies throughout as I page through it. Let me just uh, read to you the beginning of chapter eight. Chapter eight, the tweeny trap. I've never had an actual physical experience to compare it with, but I know that nothing on earth could be this wonderful. I have such complete peace afterward, such a soaring sense of totality and soul fulfillment. Please do not misunderstand me, doctor. I have nothing against any of this, and I certainly do not wish to lose Peter. I doubt that I could live without him, but he has become so impetuous and, and it goes on. So clearly sounds, you know, nothing like Ed Wood. Um, next up. So this is a publisher that Ed definitely did work for. This is a, a triumph fact book, if you can read it there, triumph fact book. So uh, I have actually quite a few of the triumph fact series as well as the triumph fiction series. So Drag Trade by Ed Wood was a triumph fact book. And uh, the fiction series, Suburbia Confidential, which Ed also wrote uh, under the pseudonym Emil Moreau, that is also put out by uh, actually uh, Triumph News Corporation, so uh, as a triumph fiction book. So they published a couple of different lines of paperbacks. They also had a wide variety of magazines. So when you see TNC in the upper corner of an, of an old uh, West Coast magazine from the late 60s or early 70s, principally the late 60s, TNC is uh, denoting Triumph News Corporation. So kind of like Golden State News, a big distributor who had a lot of different uh, uh, content provided to them by some smaller publishers as well as their own uh, rather uh, you know, sizable publishing arm. So I love the Triumph Facts series and the Triumph Fiction series. I, like I said, I've got a ton of them. So just getting these, uh, any of them is really cool. This one is number 124 in the series and it is called Virgin Virginity, It's Causes and Cures. Virginity, It's Causes and Cures by Lydia Swan. Lydia Swan, which obviously is, uh, sounds very much like a pseudonym. So let's look inside. This is in beautiful shape too. This is actually totally unread. This hardly has any scuffs on it even. Spine is tight. When I tell you how much I paid for these books, you guys are gonna be rather alarmed. Oh, this is fascinating. So we've got by Lydia Swan on the cover. And then we've got on the inside title page, we've got Virginity, Its Causes and Cures by Mariana Carr. Mariana Carr. So could Mariana Carr have been the real name of Lydia Swan? That's the kind of thing actually I've seen before where uh, you know they make a flub like that, put a pseudonym on the front cover, the real name on the inside, or complete could be completely unrelated. Maybe they're both pseudonyms. Maybe they're both real people. Maybe neither one of them wrote this. Well, we may or may not ever know, but it's a kind of a cool clue uh, having those two different names uh, as both being uh, listed as author of this book. Triumph Fact Book. So this is copyright 1968 by Dominion Publishing Company. So Dominion Publishing Company, and they've got a PO box in Van Nuys, PO box 2507, Van Nuys, California. So uh, Dominion Publishing was actually uh, the paperback arm of the Triumph News Corporation. The dedication to all the virgins of the world who have yet to meet love head on. It's very sweet, very sweet, obviously. Then we get into uh, the uh, chapter index, the book itself. There's a preface. Okay, the preface starts out with something a little, a little bit more graphic. Preface, the erect penis is in, the cherry is out. The girl with a yen is in, the man with it, without it is out. The lid is off Pandora's box. Today, the once cherished maidenhood is no longer the be all, nor marriage the end all, nor is chastity the great panacea for, like, for the world's ills. Semper Virginie, virgin forever, has become inconsistent with the ever-growing awareness of the beauties of sexual love. So then there's some more Latin quotes. <laughs> so, uh, Virgins are getting younger, said a Los Angeles gynecologist. So this looks pretty fascinating to me. Again, I love the Triumph, uh, Triumph paperbacks. So I'm really looking forward to reading this. Again, no indication that it had anything to do with this. In fact, this looks like a... It looks like this goes all over the map with case studies, with a uh, little bit of everything. It does look a little bit uh, more graphic. Not, not graphically uh, 
So to the extent that you would see by the early 1970s, just a few years later, when you look at like, if you were to look at Liverpool Library Press books or something like that, they get really into really graphic language with a lot of language uh, that would offend the general sensibility. This kind of stuff is, again, it presents it a little more clinically. So uh, as an example, when his tongue touched the crease, I nearly rose off the bed. That first time I had to hold his head there because he kept moving it too much for me to reach a climax. But I trained him. I trained him to bring me to orgasm and repaid him by masturbating him. So quid pro quo. So I think what the meaning of that is. Oh, uh, let me look at the back real quick. Is deflower power the new way of life? Is virginity a precious gift or an embarrassing necessity to only the very young? Is chastity no longer sacred? Has the virgin image lost its luster? Lydia Swan explores contemporary attitudes towards premarital sex with sharp wit and a novel insight into sexual taboos. She gives us some startling and well-founded answers. Startling, right? We hear that word, uh, of course, startling, crop up in Ed quite a bit. Again, it's not... Uh, signatory uh, necessarily it's one word uh that being said that was the back cover blurb right again noting what i mentioned earlier that uh, somebody was, could very well have been writing promotional material that wasn't necessarily the author of the book um do i know that that was him on the basis of that one word startling no way absolutely not uh you'll get fooled uh, if you start thinking that uh, the mere mention of something that you've seen ed mentioned before is a, a guarantor of his presence uh it's far more complicated. Again, you've got to look at clusters of uh, different kinds of uh, textual signatures, and uh, that can go from keywords to sentence structures to syntax to things far more complicated than I'm even going to get in here uh, into here today. So let's move on. Some of these I'll go through a little bit more quickly because, again, I just grabbed them uh, because they. Uh, were really great price and they were from some publishers that were kind of interesting. Oh, this is perfect because if you could see it, that's TN, notice the TNC there, a Dominion book, TNC, Triumph News Corporation. So this is another Triumph book. This is uh, Triumph News Corporation number 206. Uh, and it is The Scandalous Scoundrel by Wallace Arthur, Lusty Adventures of a Boudoir Bandit, a rowdy rascal who out triumphs Tom Jones in amorous conquests and outrageous sex escapades. And then the back cover has just a little quick blurb on it. Neither sisters of the cloth nor ladies of quality were safe from the charms of Robin the Ready, a rogue so bold and passionate that he risked his very life to satisfy his lusts. <laughs> Robin the ready. So this sounds interesting. I didn't, I bought this again because I thought, oh, it's a Triumph book, uh, Triumph paperback, going to grab it, got it for a good price. I actually wasn't all that interested in this one because it's, again, the whole Tom Jones, I don't know, it sounded a little uh, little goofy to me. But having read that, that back cover blurb, Robin the Ready, I'm actually now a little more intrigued. Take a look here. If you guys could see, this has an old sticker on it. So this was sitting in a bin somewhere, probably for a very, very long time with a 25 cent sticker on it. No one ever bothered to grab it. Shame on them, shame on them. Uh, it is in essentially new condition, a little bit of scuffing on it, on the ed edges and things, but I could tell it's not been read. You can tell because uh, you would start to see the pages, especially where you, where you would finger the pages with your thumb on a paperback that's been read, you can start to see the oil from your fingers will start to make the pages separate a little bit and start to color them in a different way. Uh, this clearly never been read before until now, until I get to it at some point in the near future. The Scandalous Scoundrel compiled by his kinsman, Wallace Arthur. So it's his kinsman, Wallace Arthur, the Robin the Reddy's kinsman who wrote this. Copyright 1968 by Dominion, again on Van Nuys Boulevard. Uh, so it starts out, a word of warning, despite its deceptively mild start, the confessions of a rogue abounds in possibly some of the, uh, some of the raciest sexual descriptions ever written. I first came upon these old mildewed manuscript, manuscripts in a chest in the basement of my aunt's house in London, England. So this is an old, uh, an old ploy too. The lost man, the lost sex manuscript has been found, and uh, we're releasing it. Th that's interesting. That uh, here, right out of the gate, it refers to it as confessions of a rogue, right? Whereas the cover calls it the scandalous scoundrel. So, in any case, another Dominion book. Very cool. Next up, Ona. Kind of a 
different kind of cover, right? Kind of a cool cover. Oh yeah, 47 cents is the uh, sticker on this one. So 47 cents, nobody wanted it for uh, even 47 cents. This is Triumph News Corporation number 328. So this is a little bit later. Um, given the index number, Ona, her husband left her with real money. Now she needed a real man. By William Danch. I believe I've, I've seen the name William Danch before in adult paperback. So off the top of my head, my immediate reaction is I think uh, William Danch was actually a, a, you know, a reasonably prolific uh, paperback author. Again, could be misrecollecting that. Obviously got a lot of work to do. Point here being, I just want to unbox these things for you and going to kind of hopefully uh, intrigue you with uh, some of the uh, inf some of the information around West Coast publishers uh, in that orbit, in that universe where Edward was writing at the time. But uh, in any case, it is a Triumph book. So again, I like uh, collecting the Triumph books. So this one, back cover blurb. Ona Fleming's sexual frigidity was representative of her phony upper-class society. Absolutely no one or anything could excite her. Then she met tough Mike Toady, and he dared to invade Ona's community, her heart, and her body. The impact was felt by Tracy, Ona's teenage sister who knew sex was good, Randy, Mike's former mistress whose sex life became mysterious, Bruce Henderson, a moralistic citizen who liked nothing better than to produce live sex shows for his party guests. Everyone experienced new sensations as their shackled sex lives were freed. <laughs> uh, this sounds like it's going to be a fun read, no doubt. It's got an ad in the back, and, and it's not unusual for uh, paperbacks to have ads in the back where uh, coupons that you could clip out and check the box, you know, buy five paperbacks for, uh, you know, $4 or whatever the case may be. This is uh, actually, you can join the Spitfire Book Club, a wealth of stimulating reading. Join now for special discounts. Fiction, 95 cents or any five for 444. Fact, 125 or any five for 555. So this was a really good deal back in the day. Um, drag trade, there it is. You can't see this, I don't think, but uh, it's listed here on the Spitfire Book Club ad does list drag trade. And of course it's Triumph uh, Fact Book number 106. And it says drag trade slash wood inside story of men who enjoy being women. So, um, cool. That's cool in and of itself that there's an ad for drag trade in this book. Wow, we've got a uh, really small print again. So this is a pretty lengthy manuscript. Let's go back to the first couple of pages and see if there's anything interesting. 1968 copyright, Van Nuys, California Dominion Publishing. Chapter one. Although she was still a mile away, Ona Fleming could see the sign of the club flame being erected. The club flame being erected. The car aped toward it. The car sped toward it. Sorry. <laughs> As the sign grew larger, Ona noted that it was not very realistic, appearing almost hot against the light blue spring sky. Quickly, she rejected the mental description, shaking her head in a quick negative gesture that made the blonde curls about her ears shimmer and mix with the sun's rays. All right. So, again, the language doesn't give me any anything obviously jumping out at me that it gives me any indicator that Edward had anything to do with this. But uh, based on what I'm looking at here, like I said, just glancing at it, I'm really looking forward to reading Ona. Triumph, another Triumph book. <clears throat> Next up. Triumph News Corporation number 123, a Triumph fact book. So another in the fact book series. And this is She Prostitute. Really great cover image, uh, line drawing, colored in. Uh, very, very typical of its day. That, that kind of uh, kind of line drawing is uh, not uncommon even in the images, the illustrations that you'll see in the pendulum magazines. Uh, it was just a, a common sort of artistic style at the time. And certainly for the folks who were drawing covers as well as drawing images for magazines, they weren't gonna you know, expend a whole zillion uh, hours of effort on it. It was pretty much throwaway sort of stuff, but they came up with some evocative stuff and just kind of very simple line drawings of this sort. This one is uh, detailed case histories of five hardened prostitutes. So right off the bat, you know, I'm, I'm sold. Uh, and then on the back, it says, what makes a prostitute? She prostitute is a descriptive, intelligent appraisal of the lives of five hardened prostitutes as they see themselves. 
Editor's note, step inside the minds of five women who sell their bodies. Are these women sick, confused, or are they merely pathetic victims of their environments? Read She Prostitute and draw your own conclusions. Draw your own conclusions. They present the facts. A Triumph Fact Book is going to present you the facts so that you can draw your own conclusions. Very much like the news media in, in today's world. <laughs> and I don't even mean that facetiously. I, I shouldn't even say that in today's world. That's a terrible thing to say. Um, she Prostitute by Wallace Arthur, again, is uh, credited on the inside. Hold on a second. Let me think here for a moment. Wallace Arthur, Sue, he is indeed the author of The Scandalous Scoundrel, Robin the Ready, as told to Wallace Arthur. So here's another Wallace Arthur book. This one, uh, Triumph News Corporation, number 123, Triumph Factbook, She Prostitute. Uh, copyright 1968, first printing July 1968. That's good to see a little more specificity. Then we've got uh, its case files again. So we've got the case of Mary West, the case of Neil Emerald, the case of Sally Smith, the case of Ruth Laurie, and the case of Opal White uh, in five parts. We've got a preface by Wallace Arthur. He talks about the oldest profession and these case histories. And then we get into the book itself. Again, pretty small print here. So this is a reasonably lengthy manuscript for, this actually goes on. Uh, 190 pages with relatively small print. So this is a, ver a veritable epic of, of this sort. I'll read one quick paragraph and then we'll move on. I tell him not to talk so soppy. Had he ever seen me struggle? But he goes on topping, talking about rape until I get properly bored and fall asleep. When I wake up next morning, he's all packed and ready to... There's so many misspellings here. I, I'm sorry. Ready to scarper out of there. I believe that should be scamper. I get up all upset, but he says it's immoral, and immoral is spelled wrong, of him to be corrupting me like this. And anyway, he has to go. Go is actually spelled wrong. G-O-E. I'm not making it up. To go to Paris on the next plane. So he swears he'll write. Again, it's as mangled. And leaves me a fistful of pound notes and just goes. Just like that. Naturally, I never heard from him again, and again is spelled A-G-E-N. So, uh, interesting. <laughs> That's a lot of, uh, it, it wasn't uncommon, and you'll find, uh, in matter of fact, and if you read Ed Wood paperbacks, you'll find on occasion, or if you read magazine stories in the Pendulum Mags, you'll find that uh, there can be a lot of uh, grammar and punctuation errors, misspellings, things of that nature, commonly. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't an editorial function at, uh, at uh, the Triumph News Corporation, so to speak. Pretty much, get me a manuscript, we're gonna print it, knowing that the audience isn't going to really care one way or the other if uh, you have uh, some misspellings here and there. Again, my theory being that probably most people never got very far into it to even care one way or the other. They probably threw the book you know, into a, into a trunk with the rest of their pornography and it sat and sat and sat until somebody found it in an attic somewhere, you know, uh, grandpa's, you know, here we found grandpa's porn collection, you know, and there's books like She Prostitute there. Who knows? But in any case, uh, that's uh, interesting that two Wallace Arthur books in this batch. So that's kind of cool. I'm happy with that. Next up is an original Triumph novel. So this is Triumph News Corporation number 319. So this is a Triumph novel. So this is not a fact book. It's a novel. Um, the Spy Who Came to Bed, credited to John Nemec, Nemec, the great new sex and spy thriller is what this is, in case you were wondering. Oh, wow. I just had a crazy moment. So this is why this is so much fun for me. So finding that ed, uh, ad for drag trade was kind of cool. Uh, just seeing these public publishers logos on actual paperbacks from back in the day is obviously really cool but it's little things like this that make it all worthwhile and i'll share it with you in one moment because i'm kind of excited so i, I talked about uh, you know simple line drawing this one is a uh, looks a little bit more um uh, drawn so to speak with uh, again it's colored in but again this is a, a pretty quick sort of sketched in drawing and there was a pup there was a, a sorry, not a publisher, there was an uh, artist 
who sometimes drew images for some of the Pendulum and Calga magazines, and he signed them with the name AirTag, E-R-T-A-G. I have no clue. I've never known who AirTag was. I know that uh, Phil Cambridge, was, uh, who's quoted in Nightmare of Ecstasy and was friends with Ed Wood, he drew a lot of images, uh, uh, graphic images for the Pendulum Mags, a lot of the splash pages that accompany Ed's short stories, some really great stuff there, including some really wonderful Phil Cambridge work. But I've seen stuff by AirTag before, so you can't see it inevitably here because of the glare and because how small it is, but maybe you can, maybe you can. AirTag, so this image cover image is by AirTag as well. Very cool. So um, on the inside cover, he tattooed a series of red marks down her stomach, kisses that turned her, that turned, in, that burned into her, sorry, this is real small print as well, that burned into her and sizzled there, smoking like bullet holes. Arousal numbed for an instant. She was squeezing and bending him at the place where he had reached the limit of size and endurance. So again, we get in this kind of euphemistic language, getting a little bit more graphic as we inch along because this is in fact 1968 as well. First printing May of 1968. Triumph News, Van Nuys, uh, work of fiction, purely coincidental, if this uh, looks like anybody that you may know. Uh, opening paragraph, chapter one. Rudy Hevison paused at the fountain and filled a cup with cool, transparent water. He hated to make decisions while he was thirsty, especially a decision like this, which could involve and threaten the life of someone dear to his heart, himself. All right. Uh, again, I'd have to you know, go through this. Uh, carefully and uh, see what is going on here. But it sounds interesting. I'm, I'm very excited, like I said, that uh, very excited that uh, it's got an AirTag cover that I was able to spot that and got my hands on a copy of this. So very happy about that. I'm looking at, this sounds almost like it's a little bit more hard boiled sort of Mickey Spillane-ish type of thing with a lot of, uh, a lot of dialogue and things like that. So credited to John Nemec, the back cover, a thriller, devastating and violent. We just, we defy anyone to guess the outcome of the spy who came to bed. And so I'll read this quickly. Russia was plotting to destroy the government's latest defense project, and they would stop at nothing, absolutely nothing. But the CIA had an ace up its sleeve by the name of Rudy Heveson. Women, even lesbian counter spies like Carol, found Hever Heverson, he's so he's Heveson or Heverson, irresistible, and it was a strange assortment of thrill-seeking females who could give him the information he needed. Cold, detached, and tough, he bounced from bed to bed, trying to piece together the puzzle of the mysterious Russian agent behind the plot. The girls could give him answers and satisfaction, or a bullet between the eyes. <laughs> so, again, that one's a little more action-packed type of thing. That kind of, the I, I meant, I said Mickey Splain, but uh, truthfully, that kind of uh, hard-boiled uh, backhand uh, type of approach is not uncommonplace in a lot of adult paperbacks. Some of them are just all straight up sex, but uh, that kind of hard boiled uh, type of approach that it looks like the spy who came to bed is, is in that vein. Very commonplace across adult paperbacks where they just obviously ratchet up the sexual element. And sometimes, you know, the, the kind of the wrong aspect of the sexual element, especially in today's world where uh, there's no tolerance whatsoever for that kind of misogyny. And I'm, I'm glad there's not. So uh, that uh, cultural artifact is, is ultimately what these things kind of are. If you read, even uh, just going back to Mickey Splane for a second, you read a Mickey Splane book today, it's like, wow, that's really offensive, right? That, that is, again, some people would think, well, it's a cultural artifact. At the time he was writing, that wasn't really necessarily offensive to anybody. Guess what? It's offensive. It's offensive, the, that kind of violent, uh, uh, sneering, misogynistic attitude towards women. So uh, it is commonplace again, though, in this kind of material. So you're going to need to um, put a, a stiff upper lip in play if you're going to get through these books without uh, without getting too uh, upset or offended. Again, I'm able to sort of separate from and say it's a cultural artifact, while at the same time recognizing that uh, should have never been written in the first place, in my opinion. Uh, the fact that it was makes it all the more interesting somehow, as we see these these cultural. Uh, turning points and we see the cultural evolve, uh, the relationships between men and women evolve. Uh, this is a real uh, catalytic moment, the, the, I guess, encroachment on mainstream society of, of actual sexual pornography. And uh, again, whether you're talking graphic, hardcore sex films, or you're talking these more quaint paperbacks in the late 50s and early 60s, this is all largely something new to the average person, uh, completely had been almost unavailable to them before. 
and it could really have only happened once and did only happen once where uh society had to you know go through that now we're we're on the other side of it and uh in, in today's world although I, like i said uh, we may have more enlightened views um the the content within the pop culture today is far more uh graphic and and uh more adult generally than than i would have thought possible when i was a teenager you know growing up in the 1980s so anyway this is not a sociological lesson and i'd be ill suited to perform that but it is a paperback unboxing, so the next one is Terry. As you can see, this is France Books again. There it is, France Books, the logo. First American printing, a mere 75 cents. 75 cents you could have got this. You can see it's also the, the France logo is the flag, but they also have a key right below the pricing on, on their covers. This is in beautiful shape. This is completely unread. This is absolutely astounding to me. Um, these can go, these France books, actually, because I've been looking at them online quite often recently, trying to see what's out there. And they can go upwards of, you know, commonly 15, 20, 25 dollars a pop, uh, which isn't overly expensive for older paperbacks. But considering these are pretty obscure paperbacks and not necessarily written by anybody or known to be written by anybody of any import, um, a little bit pricey. For the first time in years, Dr. Keith Lawson was at a complete loss for words. His eyes moved slowly over the loveliness of her, the sleek throat and shoulders, the rapidly rising and falling pink and white breasts, the slender waist that swelled into her lush hips, which in turn tapered into incredibly graceful thighs. Even her toes seemed to be bemused eyes, to his bemused eyes to be perfection itself. Then a little impatient sound from her throat recalled his attention to her still offered arms, and he sank into their embrace. So a little a little preview there on the opening page. So this is Terry by Dominic Plato. Dominic Plato, it sounds very much like a pseudonym to me, uh, not a name I'm familiar with. Again, this is International Publications Incorporate, Incorporated. It's 1963, this one. So this is a later, a later France title. Uh, it doesn't have an index number on it, but it's, a, again, published out of the Melrose Avenue address. Cover photo posed by professional model. This one says does not attribute the photo to Hal Guthu. This is uh, Fran for the record. This is France book 1063 by the index numbers. So that's interesting. So they started at about a thousand. So this is a thousand and sixty three. So uh, in a short period of time, in just a couple of years, they were relatively prolific published. Uh, uh, I would think if these index numbers are consecutive, this would be the 63rd France book published so there very likely could have been even more beyond that uh contents page index then we go chapter one dr keith lawson felt a little sad as he walked the two blocks from the graduate hospital to a spruce street home in downtown philadelphia it was past midnight all right so sounds like a pretty standard opening we're in philadelphia that's kind of interesting uh It's you look for clues like that, right? You look for clues. You say, um, if we're in Philadelphia, to what degree is the the writing really obviously uh, written by somebody who born and raised there and knows the town like the back of their hand? I'm using Philadelphia as an example because that's the case in this book. So um, you can obviously appropriate a setting as a, as a novelist, but for anybody who's written fiction before, I have a long, long time ago. Uh, you commonly draw from your own experiences and the characters that you uh, create, they have your experiences as their memories. They live in places where you live, things like that. So uh, again, just a comment uh, on the basis of having noticed that this is set in Philadelphia. Not gonna get any further into that. Ends with a, a, a scene at the morgue. Sounds interesting. I won't give you a spoiler as uh, if you do intend to go track down a copy of Terry. The back uh, cover blurb on this one, though, I read this, uh, you know, obviously when I was looking at these books before I purchased them. And this one really sounds like really fun. Fun if you like this sort of thing. Terry wanted to, had to get rid of her husband once she knocked him on the head and dumped him into the river. But as the saying goes, a bad penny. Another time, she shot him. Between those two attempts, however, she angled with other men, the daughter of one, and she wrestled, she wrestled with her conscience. But she was not at all prepared for the final horror, which sent her into the monstrous world of paranoia, finally and irrevocably. Terry. So that sounds like fun. 
Another France book, happy to get it. Let's see what we got next. We are, we're well, we're more than halfway now, so we're getting there guys. And I appreciate your patience if you've hung in there this long. I didn't uh, quite intend to uh, talk for quite this length, but uh, uh, I'm clearly, you know, having having a good time looking through these books, and I hope you guys are deriving a little bit of uh, pleasure and benefit from watching me unbox them. This is another Triumph book, so this is a Triumph classic. So they'd have, you know, Triumph Fiction, Triumph Facts. This is a Triumph classic. You could see TNC. This is number 205 by Dane V. Soren, Tyranny, a man and a prostitute in their epic struggle against unbelievable terrorism and brutality. Complete and unexpurgated. So again, this is gonna be a classic, you know, an old sex manuscript that we're bringing back to life for today's audiences. And sure enough, I turned it over and uh, that's essentially what it's promising on the back. It says straight, straight from the European underground, straight from the European underground. And it is the first time in paperback, so. Uh, Hmm. Here's the final paragraph, and then we'll go back to the the index pages and look at that. But uh, again, don't think of this as a spoiler for me. I'm not going to remember uh, how this ended. As he worked in, deep into her loins, it occurred to him that he'd really robbed the National Libertarian Front of everything they possessed. <laughs> so that's the final line. So obviously there's a lot of narrative to uh, feed into that statement. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense out of uh, out of context. Tyranny, a Triumph Classic, copyright 1968, first printing, May 1968. So yet another Triumph book from May 1968. Uh, Editor's Forward talks about uh, Triumph News and uh, picking up classical erotica. So that's kind of cool. That'll be a little bit of a historical piece. And it goes on for Wow, seven full pages of intro, uncredited to anybody. Who's Dane? It ends with, and Dane V. Soren, we'll let you make your own conjectures as to his identity. So whatever that really means, Los Angeles, 1968. All right, so um, again, the Euro straight from the European underground. So an old classic uh, sex book reputedly making its way back to, uh, for the first time, its first American printing, as a matter of fact. We're getting to the bottom of the box. Uh, we're packing material. TNC number 303, so this is Triumph News Corporation again. TNC 303. Kiss her, kill her. Again, this one this one looks like it's promising a little bit of a James Bond type of thing. To know Pamela was to know the dizzy heights of ecstasy and the black depths of depravity and despair. Then on the back, pay off for a witch. Pamela was blessed or cursed with exquisite beauty and the compulsion and the compulsive need to give, and give she did, to Nick Franco an outlet for his frustration in which he wallowed and drowned, to Pete Neville, his manhood, which she proceeded to destroy, to Bo Bilden, the punishment he craved and the justice he dreaded, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you got a lot of uh, first and last names there, which uh, again, immediately indicates to me that not likely something, this, this book is not likely something that Ed might've written, but we're going to check it out. We'll give it a read and we'll dig into it. As it is, it's credited to Troy Stevens. Troy Stevens, not a name that's ringing a bell for me. And uh, in matter of fact, I would think that sounds a little bit like a pseudonym. Troy Stevens, very, very plain and bland. This one is uh, a little bit earlier for Triumph News. Copyright 1967, August 1967, first printing. First chapter, just so uh, I'm uh, again covering my bases. Pamela Dean was on her back when I first saw her. I felt like a peeping Tom. I felt like I had intruded upon the delicious privacy of a woman's bedroom. I had, and I felt like hell. <laughs> I have a feeling he'll get over that as the book wears on, but uh, that is Kiss Her, Kill Her, Triumph News Corporation. This is uh, Triumph News Corporation number 326. Again, Triumph logo. This is The Star by Court Martin. Court Martin, which sounds again like it could be a pseudonym, but uh, 
Maybe not. I'm just looking to see if I can see. Uh, now these covers have got me looking to see if I could see any sort of uh, signature by the cover artist, and I don't. So this is The Star by Court Martin. Copyright 1968 by Dominion Publishing, Van Nuys, California. First printing, June of 1968. Oh, this is good because I'm getting more data. By the same author, Blood Jungle. By the same author, Blood Jungle. So Court Martin also wrote Blood Jungle, according to this anyway. Chapter one, Jerry Bell was with Brenda when he really should have been with Marcy but it was Brendan. She was turning him inside out with her caresses. He didn't care about Marcy just then. He couldn't. Too many wild things were happening to him. She had the best part of him in her hand, and he could have wept with the joy it gave him. She held him gently. I'll stop. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, I like that opening, quite frankly, because it's, boom, right into the action. Uh, and that's what that's what would have kept a guy reading back in the day, right? He'd be reading something, he'd go, well, do I really want to know about uh, the National Liberation Front? Or do I want to know about, you know, what's going on at this this hospital and the, the dynamics of, of the doctors and the nurses? Or do I want to have, or do I want to read scenes of people having sex? What do I want? So a, a book like The Star, at least would have got you over the hump. The opening paragraph would have at least uh, gotten you uh uh, interested enough to hang in there and say, oh yeah, this is this is the kind of book that I've been looking for. Uh, cool image on the back, little graphic image. The Star is a brightly poignant novel about an idealistic crooner who discovers that showbiz is an all glitter and glory. Glory, a sex and sensitive story, at times tragic and sordid, but always powerfully moving. And that's a quote <laughs> by Neil Frank, of the Spitfire Book Club. So we remember we saw the Spitfire Book Club ad previously, which is where we saw drag trade advertised. Uh, so the Spitfire Book Club obviously is a, a, a fiction, a fictional book club that uh, really is uh, Dominion slash TNC selling their paperbacks through this book club. So this is a guy from the book club reputedly praising the star by Court Martin. Uh, oh, we've got we've got advertisements in the back. Oh wow, we've got uh, one, two, three, four. We've got four full pages of ads for the Spitfire Book Club. There again is drag trade mentioned. There is. I'm just looking through it real quick. These are all Triumph books, and uh, actually, I have a lot of these books uh, additional to the Triumph books that I've unboxed here today. Suburbia Confidential mentioned also. Moreau. So that's number 305, TNC 305, Suburbia Confidential, Moreau. Decadence and Depravity in Suburbia. So Suburbia Confidential, Decadence and Depravity in suburb Suburbia. And uh, well, yeah, I'll look obviously more closely at uh, this and all the others soon, but uh, that's another Triumph book. I didn't realize, I, I realize now, obviously, as I'm going through all these, the, the preponderance of uh, TNC titles that I've got. All right, so there's only two more to go. TNC Fiction, number uh, 336, uh, Triumph News Corporation, number 336. Mary Jane's Man, a bank heist followed by a hijacking. The whole mess complicated by by girls eager for weird thrills. So, uh, again, never read in really, really great condition. A little bit of scuffing on, on the shelfware, but incredible condition, tight spine. Mary Jane's Man by Sean Ahern. Sean Ahern. Copyright 1969. Dominion Publishing Company. Uh, P.O. Box. So uh, now we don't have a Van Nuys address. We've got a P.O. Box, P.O. Box 3910 out of North Hollywood, 91609. So uh, at some point, Dominion uh, slash TNC decided to uh, uh, shift their mailing address at very least. Again, that could be not dissimilar to what I talked about earlier, where Bernie had to shift gears and start a different publishing company to get away from some things, perhaps. Same type of deal. Let's uh, go off and, uh, you know, get ourselves uh, located elsewhere. Uh, 
for whatever reason, or perhaps simply the ease of it, right? If it's a PO box, probably a mail drop, right? There were these mail drops, from what I understand, around West and North Hollywood at the time. They uh, were not only for uh, adult magazines and books, but but mail drops meaning that uh, uh, you hired somebody to basically handle all your mail, handle all your orders and things like that. There was actually one, I think it was 6311 Yucca Street. Uh, so in Edwood's old vicinity, one of the one of the more uh, popular mail drops within that general vicinity back in the day. And they did, they not only handled the mail for adult publishers, but like fan clubs for celebrities and uh, et cetera, et cetera, you can imagine. So, uh, so it looks like uh, Triumph moved uh, to be handling by a by a mail drop or at least change their address to a PO box by 1969. Chapter one, the helicopter chopped through the thin air over the Santa Lucia mountains of California at an altitude of 8,000 feet above sea level. Below the mountains rose steep and green with an occasional meadow where cattle grazed belly deep in new summer grass. The altimeter said 8,000, but Tim Daly was flying at only 100 feet over the terrain. All right, so pretty descriptive prose of a sort that doesn't even remotely sound like Ed to me, even though I just read one paragraph. Uh, again, I'll have to look into this more deeply. Looking forward to reading all these books, quite frankly. I know you're probably thinking to yourself, wow, that seems like a slog. These things are not necessarily well written. There's uh, uh, not going to be really interesting characters. There's not going to be really interesting narratives. Um, it's, it's more so, again, interesting to me because it fills in uh, a lot of blanks around uh, the adult paperback industry and makes me understand more what was expected of writers within that industry, what was commonplace, common themes, motifs, etc. And uh, more so than anything, again, kind of helps me, I guess, hone in or, or zoom in a little bit, get a little bit of a closer view of the world that Ed was working in on, that, that Ed was working on at the time uh, when he was writing for all these different adult publishers, including Triumph. So that's another Triumph book. Finally, last but not least, far from uh, least, because it's another France book. So I've got three France books in this grouping of 14 books. So I'm really happy with that again, because they typically show up and they're a little bit out of my, my price range, but I uh, was able to get these for a really good price. So this is Ring-A-Ding Lover. This has got to be one of the earliest in the series. Indeed it is, it's F3. So France 3, that's... Uh, one of their very first books, I would assume. Reason I noted that was because I saw 50 cents only, only 50 cents. So this has got to be 1962. Ring-a-ding lover, uh, 1962, international publications uh, on Melrose in Hollywood. Cover photo by Jim Sullivan. Photo posed by professional model, Jim Sullivan. All right. So I don't know. that. So that was something worth looking into, right? Who was Jim Sullivan? Name not ringing a bell off the top of my head, but uh, I would assume, you know, a, a photographer at the time who shot pinups, glamour shots, things like that. Attractive shot on the cover, very much so. Ring-a-ding lover. So a beautiful girl, a three-man brutal assault, eyewitness boyfriend avenges. Uh, then on the back, suddenly the lips and tongue were gone, only the night air touched her, and without realizing it, she breathed a small sigh of protest at the loss. Her eyes opened heavily, and she was looking again into the eyes of the man who was torturing her so senselessly, first with pain, and now with this. What was it? Whatever it was, it was new to her, strength sapping, lethargy rousing. She knew instinctively that it was no good, that she must fight it, but how could she fight? So again, um, you've got... Uh, I actually thought as I was reading that, because it's commonplace, so uh, she's being assaulted, right? Um, I thought at some point as I read through this, she would, you know, the rape fantasy would kick in, which is commonplace, unfortunately, as well. You see that in a lot of literature of this uh, particular period, a lot of early adult films, you know, it hurt, I was going to, I was almost said it so i might as well say the the kind of it only hurts at first type of thing if you've uh, again read um any of the articles that i've been writing at uh, edward wednesdays on the dead to rights blog written about the uh, ed's work in porn loops and that's a that's a line a subtitle line that comes up quite often in the loops uh, uh where you know it only hurt, hurts at first kind of notion and sure enough within mere seconds the the girl uh completely comes around the bend and uh, now she enjoys it tremendously which Again, the, the rape fantasy is, it's fundamental actually to pornography. Let's be quite frank about that. And um, 
So, so again, I said I wasn't going to give you any sociological lessons, so I'll probably stop there. This is by Seth Ehrman, A-H-R-I-M-A-N, Seth Ehrman. That doesn't really sound like a pseudonym. It sounds, uh, but again, could very well be. And there's my dog barking in the background, so uh, in case you hear that. Contents page, let's read the first paragraph. It had been as nearly perfect a day as, sorry, it's a little hard, as Rick Machan could remember. Swimming, lazing in the sun, more swimming, the picnic supper, and now the floor show. Smiling, he leaned back on his elbows, the reflection of the campfire shimmering in his face, amusedly enjoying Sue's gyrations as she burlesqued an Indian war dance round and round the flames, whooping and stomping her bare feet. Hmm, that's kind of interesting opening again really small print on this one as well so a couple of these publishers you know typically uh, smaller print than I would typically see last paragraph so intent were they both on the moment that neither of them heard the rapid sequence of events that burst upon them they were blessedly unaware of the of the flinging wide of the door on her side or the instantly following crack of the Luger as it sent its first slug through her head. And, ooh, spoiler alert, see how that one ends, ring-a-ding lover. Not gonna end well for, uh, it looks like, both of the protagonists. I stopped before I uh, finished reading the sentence because uh, you can guess what happened to them both. Uh, so that's another France book, really excited to uh, get a handful of France books for the first time. Uh, really excited generally to get all those uh, Triumph News books, uh, get another pad title and to get a couple other uh, tangentially related West Coast uh, adult paperbacks from that era. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to share with you guys today. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I know it's a very niche sort of topic and uh, it seems as if uh, this is uh, for the Ed Wood Summit, perhaps a little bit only tangentially tangentially related to Ed Wood. But uh, uh, it is indeed, uh, like I said, by and large, a little bit of a fishing expedition. And I don't mind uh, performing a fishing expedition. I said I wouldn't share the invoice with you guys. So, well, the price actually. So I paid 14 bucks. As you can see, they're in fantastic condition. If you uh, buy adult paperbacks or have uh, looked into it online, uh, I think you'll be rather alarmed at what I paid for this uh, box of books. I paid $6 in shipping, gotta have them shipped. And I paid for the books themselves $43.49. This whole order with shipping, $49.49. So under 50 bucks, I was able to uh, scoop up all 14 of these books. And uh, seeing, you know, right off the top of my head, a couple of the highlights for me, seeing Ed's books uh, advertised in the back of a couple of them, and then uh, seeing the, the AirTag uh, attribution, the, the sign. AirTag signing one of one of the cover images uh, for I forget which book that was off the top of my head now because uh, that was a lot to digest. But uh, certainly, if one of these books does in fact turn out to be Edward, uh, keep uh, keep your eye on Edward Wednesdays. I'm sure I'd ultimately get around to reporting it there. Uh, or potentially reporting it here at the Edwood Summit, which uh, I'm going to increasingly do more of these videos. In fact, next up at the Edwood Summit, next on the docket, I'll have uh, Joe Blevins from the Dead Rights blog, the original uh, founder of Edwood Wednesdays, joining me so that we can uh, perform a review of a couple of Ed's pad library books. I mentioned uh, one of those titles that we looked at was a pad library book, and uh, we're gonna review a pair uh, and I'll keep it a secret as to what they are because uh, I think you're going to enjoy it, but expect that soon here at the Edwood Summit and certainly expect more videos and more articles uh, at Edwood Wednesdays at the Dead uh, to Rights blog. And I'll link to that as well as a few other items in the description box to this video. And I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Drop some comments in if you think this is like uh, utterly uh, trivial nonsense. Uh, I'd, I'd be curious to hear that. If you think it's interesting or fascinating, let me know that. Any comments whatsoever. Happy to uh, just uh, occupy a little bit of your time, and I hope that you found that it was not ill-spent. Thanks, everybody. Bye.